Hey everyone, welcome back. Today we're going to talk about load balancing in NSXT. Um, I'm going to focus primarily on the, um, you know, the out of the box load balancing functionality in NSXT. Um, I'm not going to spend any time on the advanced load balancer, which was an acquisition VMware did of uh, AV Networks. Um, I will cover that in a separate video. So in this video, we're going to dive into the one, one arm load balancer and in the uh, inline load balancer. So let's have a look at the topology I created uh, in my home lab. So I have my basic T0 and T1 routing uh, up and running using BGP. So I created four uh, basic web servers. One is a, uh, which I call, you know, the dev test workload and one is called the production workload. And I'm using two types of load balancers um, to load balance these web servers. The production web servers are being load balanced by my inline load balancer. Uh, this is nothing more than just creating a stateful service on my already existing T1 router, which is, do which is doing uh, distributed routing for my segments. So in my web segment, uh, the T1 router is now running a stateful service. Um, and this means it's in line of the routing path. So that's where the name inline load balancer is coming from. The second load balancer I created is a separate T1. So it's a T1 which I created purposely just to do load balancing. It's not connected to the T1 or to the T0 router. It's just connected with a service interface to the web segment. And this is how we're going to do load balancing using one arm. It's a single interface. So this means that um, traffic is going to um, hit the load balancer uh, going in over the interface and it's going out over the same interface. Hence one arm load balancer. So this is pretty high over the topology I created. Um, let's dive into the lab and see um, how we need to create this stuff. All right, let's first take a look at the virtual machines themselves. Um, we're going to focus on the web servers in this demo. So I created uh, two dev test web servers, um, which are connected to the web segment. And I created two production web servers, which are also created to the web segment. Uh, in another video, we're going to do micro segmentation using the distributed firewall to isolate the production and dev test workloads. But for now, um, production and dev test is running in the same segment. Now, um, I'm running a simple three tier application, a uh, demo application in my production workload. And as you can see here, if I, uh, this is the load balancer IP. If I refresh and there it is, uh, it's traffic is now being uh, directed to the web server uh, number two. My dev test workload is a bit less fancy. It's just basically a default web server. And I added the name of the server in the title. Um, again, this is the VIP address of the load balancer. And if we do a bit of refreshing, I think my web browser is caching a bit. At some point it should hit web server number two. So this is how we're going to test our load balancers. In the previous video, we were only doing distributed routing on the T1. And at that point, um, there was no stateful service running on that T1. Now we're going to add load balancing as a stateful service. So we need to provide the edge cluster um, containing the edge nodes that will take care of the stateful service. Um, so in this case, I added my edge cluster to the configuration of this T1 router. Um, What's really important for low balance traffic is that we need to advertise the routes um, to the outside world. And for sake of this demo, I just um, enabled the distribution or the advertisement of all types of routes. But um, typically we're now only looking at the load balance VIP routes, which should um, be advertised to the rest of the world. We're going to look at the physical routers in a minute to see that the route to the VIP address of this uh, load balancer is, ac is actually being advertised using BGP. Um, now, because this is a one uh, an inline uh, load balancer, we don't need to 
configure a service interface that's only needed for the inline load balancer or for the one arm load balancer, apologies. Um, so I enabled stateful services by providing the edge cluster. Now we can go to the load balancing tab in uh, or the menu in NSXT and we can create our inline load balancer. Now, in order to create a load balancer in NSXT, we need to provide three things. First, we need to uh, configure the server pool. The server pool is the actual pool containing the virtual machines or the servers to which the load balancer can direct its traffic. Second, we need to create a virtual server for the load balancer. Uh, this is going to uh, contain a, a VIP address, a virtual IP address, um, which will uh, be used to connect the, uh, the clients to. So my browser is going to connect to the VIP address and the VIP address uh, in the load balancer is going to uh, make sure that traffic is being load balanced to the server pool in the back end. So you can see the virtual server as being the front end and the server pool is the actual back end. Now the last uh, number three that we need to take care of is uh, the creation of the load balancer itself. So first up, let's take a look at the load balancer pool. Uh, my inline load balancer is doing um, uh, load balancing for my production web service. You can see here that I created a group containing the two production web servers and I created a virtual server using a layer 4 TCP um, uh, configuration which basically uh, is only doing uh, load balancing on a specific port, a TCP port that I provided, which in this case is port 80. So this is the, uh, the virtual IP address, the VIP address of the load balancer. This does not have to be an IP address in the subnet belonging to the segment. So in my case, my web segment is 10.0.100.0/24. The virtual IP address um, is not part of that subnet. It's not part of that network. So the virtual IP address is does not have to be part of the uh, of the segment itself. So in my case, my web segment is using 10.0.100.0/24 as a subnet. So the virtual IP address is going to be routed. That's why it's an inline routed connection. So we're load balancing on port 80 using layer, a layer 4 TCP load balancer. Um, lots of other stuff you can configure on the, um, on the load balancer itself. Um, I'm not going to go into all the specifics. Um, I'm going to leave a link to a really excellent slide deck uh, covering load balancing really extensively in the description. It's a really uh, great piece of resource being put out there by VMware. I'm not going to go over all the details in this short video. Um, last step in our uh, configuration of the inline load balancer is the creation of the load balancer itself. So I created a uh, server load balancer I'm doing a small load balancer because this is just, just a demo and I'm connecting it to my uh, T1 gateway. I configure the virtual server and the virtual server uh, contains the, uh, the server pool. So that's the hierarchy, a load balancer, virtual server, server pool. <clears throat> now, next up is the other load balancer, which is going to be the um, one arm load balancer. Well, the one arm load balancer is connected to a dedicated T1 router. So I created a new T1 uh, gateway called load balancer T1. This one is, the, is not connected to the T0 gateway. It's only connected to the web segment using an, a service interface to the web segment. Now, this does need to be a, a valid IP address in the subnet used in the web segment. Because this um, load balancer is connected to the segment, it needs to find a way to the outside world. So we need to add a static route, in this case, um, pointing to the default gateway. The T1 gateway, which is doing distributed routing for all the virtual machines in the web segment, is also the default gateway for this one-arm load balancer. So I added a default gateway um, 
pointing towards that um, IP address of that T1 router. Now back to the load balancer itself. So the one arm load balancer is created in the same way that we created the previous load balancer. This time it's connected to the dedicated load balancer T1. Um, the virtual server is also created. And since this is a, uh, a one arm load balancer, the IP address needs to be part of this segment. So I need to free up or use a free IP address in the web segment pool. Um, I'm doing a load balancing on port 80. This time I'm doing layer seven load balancing just for sake of the demo. So I'm creating a layer seven uh, HTTP load balancer in this case. Um, it's connected to the one on load balancer and the server pool is uh, a server pool pointing to my uh, dev test workloads web service. So um, this is basically it. One thing I forgot to point out when we looked at the, um, at the inline load balancer, <clears throat> we need to advertise the route um, to the VIP address. So we created a VIP address uh, for the uh, for the load balancer, we need to advertise these uh, these VIP routes to the outside world. If I'm now looking at um, my physical router, 92.168.2.145, uh, show IP route. <clears throat> As you can see here, there's a route being advertised by the T1 gateway and the T0 gateway using BGP pointing towards that VIP address. So now that's the way that we configure uh, load balancing in NSXT. And that's it for now. Um, this was a quick overview of load balancing. A lot of specific topics I didn't cover, you know, all the... Um, the application specific load balancing options that uh, are available in NSXT. Again, I'm going to leave a link to a really, really extensive slide deck, which will cover uh, all that detailed information on load balancing. Um, this was just a quick run over of load balancing in NSXT. So thanks again for watching. Uh, don't forget to subscribe to my channel. Um, and please let me know if you are looking for any other topics you want me to cover. Thanks for watching and see you all next time.